It has been a great day to be here together, worshiping with you today, being reminded of the great freedom that we have to worship together, to seeing great things that God has done, um, and uh, anticipating great things that He's going to continue to do. I can't think of any better songs to be able to join our hearts together as we worship God than those that we've sung about in today's time where we realize we are going to have to take a stand on what we believe, understanding what we believe, to be able to face the things. But folks, just because things are changing around us, this is a challenge that we have had from day one to be able to stand and show Jesus to a world that uh, does not know him. As we continue in this sermon series of uncharted territory that I started last Sunday and talking about with the VBS theme of going off the map and what it meant to be off the map and be in uncharted territory, focusing upon Jesus and who he is as our guide. Today, I want us in the midst of this holiday weekend to talk about the challenge, the freedom that we have, the challenge of freedom, because we celebrate this freedom. But what does it really mean for each and every one of us when we are challenged with this freedom that we have? We've all been given a freedom, but in today's time, how is that going to be challenged? A couple of questions that I want to just ask you to think about along with me is what is your price for the freedom that you have? What is your price for the freedom that you have? And what I mean by that is what does it cost you to think the way that you think? What does it cost you to act the way that you act or believe in what you believe? What is the price for you to be able to think that? Because you've been given the freedom to be able to, to have that, but what does it cost you? And that's what we're going to talk about today because we're in a time of change. And I'm not just talking about laws in our country. I'm talking about everything. Students, did you know that in a month and a half school starts? <laughs> Y'all should see the look on their faces. <laughs> Such excitement. <laughs> Some will be going to a new campus or a new school. You'll have new teachers, new things that are before us. There's going to be changes for all of us. Some experiencing changes in job, in relationships, in other things, income, whatever it might be, loss of job. There are changes all around us. And what happens sometimes is we have to understand if I'm going to think a certain way or act a certain way or be a certain way, we have to understand what cost is that to me to have the freedom to be able to do that. Because we celebrate our freedom today, but what does that really mean? I think the real challenge for us today, it doesn't matter what changes we go through, because we could go back in history, folks, and see all the changes that we've had over time. There's always going to be change. But I think one of the greatest challenges for you and me today is not so much what changes are out there, but it's our identity. The greatest challenge that you and I will have today is one of identity. And what I mean by that is who are you going to identify with? Who are you going to associate yourself with? In this freedom that we have to be able to choose, who are you going to line yourself with? Because that's going to be your identity. And so we all have to come to the point of, of answering this challenge that is always going to be out there. And more in today's time of identity. Who are we going to identify with? You see what I mean? Another way to put this. Your freedom to associate and connect is going to be challenged. Because whether you realize it or not, today... Regardless of your age, regardless of where you're at in life, your stage of life, or whatever it is that you think, who you decide to associate with is who you're going to be identified with. I mean, look, in today's time, the line in the sand is becoming more definite, more real for each and every one of us, regardless of what we face. I think we're going to be challenged more and more about that today than ever before. So our freedom to associate is going to be challenged. But it's something that we shouldn't be surprised about. Because Scripture teaches us that there's going to be challenges. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that reminds you, it says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Because there's something that happens if we give our life to Christ and follow Him, something happens. And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, remember, when you choose this, 
this freedom that you have, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be challenges and persecution. He reminds, uh, John reminds us in Revelation chapter 2. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. There is a promise that Satan is at work to persecute those who believe Jesus Christ. So we shouldn't be alarmed by the new challenges that we face. We shouldn't be alarmed by this persecution and challenge of the freedom that I have to identify with Christ. Now, the, the question is, the challenge for you and me is, are you going to identify with Christ or are you not? That's the identity challenge that each and every one of us are going to face today. A couple of things that I want us to think about in this idea of the freedom to identify with Christ that we have. You see, what's going to happen for each and every one of us is we're going to be challenged in what we think. Three challenges that I want us to look at today. And the first one is the challenge to think. The challenge to think. What do you really think about all of the changes that we face? I bet if I went around and asked each and every one of you, I would get a lot of different opinions and a lot of different viewpoints, a lot of different things of what you think. But let me ask you this question. What do you think of sin? I bet if I went around the room and asked everybody, there would be a lot of different opinions about sin in itself. But folks, in today's time, this freedom to associate with Christ, we're going to be challenged in what we think. We're going to be challenged about what we think about sin. Let me say it this way. Don't raise your hands. I just want you to think about this. Think. How many of y'all think that lying is wrong? Now, how many of us lie? How many of us think that gossip is wrong? But how many of us talk about other people? How many of us think that whatever you want to do is fine with you? You see, in today's time, we're going to be challenged by the way that we think, because as we think, that's what we do. So we identify with what we think. You know, I think one of the greatest challenge, one of the other greatest challenges is that when this culture, when everybody says, hey, it's okay to do whatever you want to do. Well, as a follower of Jesus, I argue with that because it's not. And it's not because I'm better than anybody else, because trust me, I'm a sinner. And I'm in just a need of a Savior as anybody else. And every day I need Jesus in my life to mold me into what he created me to be. So I'm no better than anybody else. But what I have to do is if I'm going to identify myself with Christ, then I have to challenge myself in what I think. Let me explain it from, from a scriptural standpoint. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 says this. Jesus speaking, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And you may think, okay, Paul, this is great, but what does that have to do with the way that I think? Jesus explained and said, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, what did he mean by that? Because you may be saying, well, I thought Jesus said, come and love everybody. I thought Jesus said, come and accept everybody. I thought Jesus said that I just need to live my life and love him. Now, what is he saying that I'm supposed to be against my mother and my father? Well, no, because scripture teaches us that we're supposed to honor your father and mother. This is a commandment given to us by God. What is Jesus talking about when he says, this is what you're supposed to do? He says, this is the idea of what you think. What Jesus is saying is that if you are going to follow me, which he means by taking up your cross and follow me, if you are to follow me and identify with me, then there's going to be changes in your life that people aren't going to understand, even your own family. 
But it's this idea that as we think about who God is and what Christ has done for us, it's going to change our perspective of how we see everything, how we see our relationships with our mother and our father and our parents and in-laws and children. It's going to change the perspective of what we think. Why? Because our focus is upon God, not upon these things and relationships that we have. So Jesus says it's going to be different. So as you identify with me, you're going to think about things differently because he changes us of how we think. So when we say we're going to be challenged in how we think, it's because Jesus changes our perspective of things. Another example of this is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation. And they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, for this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in, a, in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. What Peter is saying is that, listen, we were all, all in sin. We were all doing those things that we chose to do. But because of the change through Jesus Christ that's happened, they, meaning those that still live apart from God, think that we're strange. They think that something's different about us. Because there is. That's the truth. There's supposed to be something different about us. So our challenge to think differently is because of what Christ has done for us. He says, listen, be clear-minded, think about things, be self-controlled, hold on to the truth so that you can understand who Jesus is and what he has done for you. We're going to be challenged in the way that we think. Another area of challenge that I want us to look at is the challenge to judge, the challenge to judge. Let me think, Paul, I thought we were told not to judge. (laughs) We're going to get there, but we're going to be challenged in the way that we think about what God's Word says. Now, with all of these changes and everything in our culture, like many of you, I've read reports, I've listened to news, I've read blogs, and one of the things that I do is, of course, I'm real careful what I read because we know that everything on the Internet is true. So I'm real careful about some of the things that I read. And on occasion, I'll go and I'll read something that's of a different mindset. Something that's not just from the Christian standpoint. Because I want to read, I want to try to understand, I want to see viewpoints from all ways. Because I think that's important for us to do. If we're going to stand upon truth, we've got to know what's out there and what, what other people think and believe. So that we can know how to relate the gospel truth to them in a way that will, God will be able to work. Because it's not my job to change everybody's viewpoint. It's not my job to change what you think. That's your job, your choice, your freedom. But what, what is my job is to be able to proclaim truth because that's what I believe in. And hopefully as a follower of Jesus, that's what we as a church believe in. But this idea of being challenged to judge... Let me ask you this question, because we're begged to answer this question. What determines right from wrong? What determines right from wrong? Because in my standpoint, in my opinion, what I believe may not be the same as what somebody else believes. So what determines right from wrong? For me to be able to say and for people to say, well, you're in judgment because you're, you believe something different. Well, yes, that's me. I believe something different. Does that mean that I'm in judgment or does that mean that I just have determined that something else tells me what's right and wrong and not people? And that's what we have to answer when we come to this challenge to judge. Or better yet, who determines what's right and wrong? Because if I depend, listen, church, if you depend upon me, then I'm going to fail you. Because there may be a day where I'm just not in my mind. 
not in my right mind, which Missy will say, or, or many days. Or I may be thinking something different, or I may be persuaded by... I may, may just feel a little irritable today, and so I may respond differently than I do in other days. So don't rely upon me to tell you what you need to do. And that's why we come to this point of being challenged to judge. I'm not the judge. In fact, Scripture teaches that. In James chapter 4, verse 12, it says, There is only one lawgiver and judge. Only one judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, as I read things, one of the things that troubles my heart is because many people that are not in the same mindset as I am, the same opinion as I am, as far as Christianity in the way of handling all the changes in our culture, but many people will say, looking upon the church and Christianity, that we are unapproachable, that we are judgmental, that we are hypocrites. And why is that? It's because that sometimes we come across as judgmental. Sometimes we say, I'm better than you. Sometimes we say, I'm the one that's righteous, you're not. Who are we to say that? When we do not know what the truth of God's word says. I do not judge. Because there's only one judge. And we either choose to accept him or not. I mean, there's no middle ground. There's no compromising God's truth. So when this challenge of who we are going to identify with... And when this challenge of how are we going to judge in the midst of all this that's going on, all the changes, we have to look to the one who is the judge and not each other. Scripture goes on and tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. Again, this is Jesus speaking truth. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come... I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus came to complete what was already established. The law that was given. All the prophets and what they said. Jesus said, I've come to complete that and to establish that. So again, when we're challenged to judge, it's not us who judge, but it's Jesus Christ himself who comes to accomplish that law. We cannot judge according to the law because as we all know, laws change. And so we have to come to the point of understanding who is to judge. And we identify with him. Other scriptures that talk about this. Luke chapter 6 verse 37. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Now I've heard this one a lot of times because they come back when we in our pompous state as Christianity. And what I mean by that is those Christians who look down upon other people. Listen. Don't wear the label of Christianity and think that you are holy because that doesn't make you holy and righteous to judge anybody. It's the blood of Jesus that allows me to be free, to be able to say, I'm free. If you want to be free, then you can accept the blood of Jesus also. But I'm not going to say, oh, you're condemned to hell because I don't say that. The only judge can say that. So we have to be very careful about that. But Scripture teaches us, do not judge and you will not be judged. We have to be very careful in our understanding. So yes, we are challenged to judge, not from our standpoint, but from God's standpoint. And I'm not just talking about this whole issue of homosexuality and same-sex marriage. Listen, folks, we're all sinners. And it doesn't matter if, you're, uh, if you agree with same-sex marriage or if you lie and gossip. It's all sin in the eyes of God. Church, what we need to do is realize that we're at a standpoint right now where we need to stop doing that stuff because we are hypocritical when it comes to the point of saying, oh, same-sex marriage is horrible. Well, you know what? So is gossip. And shame on us for seeing it differently. Because God says, I hate all sin. And it's the blood that covers all sin that allows us to come in freedom to be able to worship and choose God for who He is. But you know what? I'm going to be called upon, just like you're called upon, to identify with what I really believe. I have a freedom to stand up. And I stand up because Jesus died for my sins, and he died for your sins. And I stand up for him, not for my cause, not for my political views, not for what side of the aisle I stand upon. It's because of Jesus that I can say, I'm free, and everybody can be free of all the sins. So let's don't get on our high horse, because when we do, then we are seen as unapproachable. 
And we are seen as judgmental. And we are seen as hypocritical. Because it's not us who should be on the throne. It's God himself. So we're challenged to judge. Where am I? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it says this. If we deliberately keep on sinning, After we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Now, this is a powerful message when it comes to this challenge of judge. Of judging, because again, we are not in the place to judge. We have been judged by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that we are cleansed and freed of the, of those sins. But Scripture teaches us that woe to that person. How much more severely do you think somebody who chooses to disobey God, and as he puts it, has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has treated unholy his blood that makes us holy and who insulted the spirit of grace. I mentioned last Sunday that this is the arrogance of God that we have sometimes. That we say, God, I know who you are. I know what Jesus has done. I know that he died for my sins. But God, this is who I am and this is how I'm going to live and this is what I'm going to do. When we do that, it is an arrogance towards God. And let me tell you, church, when you and I begin to live that way, we better be careful because how much more severely do you think that person in that judgment will come? Church, we've got to be very, very careful. Very, very careful that every single one of us in our lives, if we are going to be challenged to identify ourselves with Christ, that we live like Christ wants us to in every aspect of our life. In how we treat people, in what we say, in what we do behind the closed door of our home. We better be very careful. The last challenge that I want to share with you is the challenge to love. Because I think it's very, very, very important for us in a time where we are called upon to stand, that we stand in the truth of God's love. That we stand in the grace of God's love. That we stand in this challenge to be able to share who God really is. Because it doesn't make us any better than anybody else, but only the love of God as he sees us as sinners whom Jesus died for all. You see, love brings about this atmosphere of grace and repentance. And it's very important that we understand because that word love is being defined in so many different ways today. (laughs) It was kind of funny... um, You know, we do this all the time when we talk about love. You know, what does that mean if I love other things that that redefines my whole perspective of thinking? If I love pizza, what does that say about my relationship to pizza? It means I'm going to eat it because I love it. But we define love in a lot of different ways in today's time. And so what we have to do is look at this challenge for you and me to love in the way that God wants us to. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Scripture explains it this way. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace... You have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. You see, what God has done for us is he's given us the answer. 
the answer to this challenge for each and every one of us. Who are you going to identify with? Who are you going to identify with? Who are you going to identify with? Because if you identify with Christ in his love that was displayed to us, then what happens is things begin to change. How I think changes because God's love now fills my heart in a way like never before. And the way that I act changes because now I am in judgment because of who God is and what he has given me so that I might live in repentance of all sin. And it's because of love. But we're also challenged because if we identify with this love, and listen church, if I identify with this love of Christ, then I better show this love. Because if not, then I'm judgmental. I'm hypocritical. I'm unapproachable. And I'm somebody stuck in my own ways in my own agenda. If I identify with the love of God through Christ Jesus, I live in repentance and His grace so that others may know this same thing. If you and I, as followers of Jesus, are not challenged in the way that we think, in the way that we relate to other people, in the way that we relate to God's truth, and in the way, the way that we relate to God's love, then folks, there's something that may be a little off within each and every one of us, which causes us to ask God, how do I see you? And how do I identify with you? Because we're in a time where people are looking for connections, and they're looking for identity, and they're looking for something out there that will give them whatever they look for. And what a great thing it is to be able to know that when that challenge comes, we can identify ourselves with the Savior who can redeem us and help us walk in repentance every day. Who do you identify with today? The challenge for each and every one of us is do I identify with Jesus and everything that he is. His grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and the redemption and repentance that he has given me. Who do you identify with? Let's pray together.